Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the University of Calgary's Legacy Giving Teams webinar on writing a will. My name is Blair Nichols, and I'm one of the fundraisers here at the university that focuses on legacy gifts or planned giving. And I'll be your host for today. So I hope you have a coffee and you want us to get us uh, somewhere comfortable. I sincerely hope you're all staying well and healthy. Remember to be kind and together we'll get through this pandemic. To begin with, I'd like to take this opportunity to not acknowledge the territorial, traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pagani, and Gainai First Nations, the Tsitsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, included, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Everyone here today has a personal reason to attend this session, but we want to leave you today understanding the importance of having an up-to-date will to mitigate future issues or problems. And secondly, if you are considering a gift to a charity, have that conversation with the folks at that charity to ensure that your gift can be accepted and used for the purpose you desire. Lastly, it gives the charity a chance to thank you in person. With our 45 minutes today, the format will be to hear from our two speakers for about 30 minutes, leaving some time at the end for questions. Please use the chat function and we'll get to them time permitting. Let's get started. This morning, we're so fortunate to have Jonathan Ng from the law firm Underwood Gilholm, who sits on the university's Legacy Giving Advisory Group. John's bio was included in the invitation, so I will not read it out loud again. But I do wanna add that both John and his wife, Melissa, are proud graduates of our law school and our proud dino. He told me he met her on the very first day of law school and he knew she was smarter than him at that point and he needed to keep her close to get him through. I'm sure that is a continued belief and, and it's even stronger today as they're raising two young children together and hopefully future dinos. Thank you, John, today for your time and you have the screen. Thank you, Blair, for the warm invitation. And good morning, everybody. I, uh, I'm going to jump straight into things here today. Um, and hopefully you will not need a second cup of coffee, but uh, hey, I'll, I'll do my best. So I'm going to uh, share some slides here. Pardon me. Uh, pausing for dramatic effect. And our technical person is shaking his head at me as we speak, wondering why. How is this kid not understanding how to do this? Give me a second, we're almost there. And I think we're rolling. Can I get a little thumbs up from Blair? Okay, good morning. Um, we're talking about writing a will. Uh, just again, I, I know you, you're provided with some, some background about me, but uh, I, I'm a lawyer here in Calgary and this is my area of practice. I spend 100% of my time helping clients, uh, potential donors, families prepare their wills. Um, uh, the rest of my time, or the other half of my time, is spent uh, helping families administer estates after someone's passed away or lost capacity. So, so this is um, something I do every day and, and I'm, I'm very happy to share with you this morning. The common question I get all the time is, do I need a will? Do I need a will? And when should I update my will? Very common questions. And uh, maybe what I'll start with today is dispelling a myth. The myth that if a person passes away without a will, that the government gets everything. That is absolutely untrue. But there is some truth in that, in that saying. And the truth is that the government has a plan. There is what I like to call a, a default will for all people who don't have a will here in Alberta. Uh, that default will can be found um, in the Wills and Succession Act and the Estate Administration Act. If anyone has issues with, with, with insomnia, look those laws up. They'll, they'll put you to sleep like that. I could read them all day long, but uh, 
what I'm telling you is that there is a default will for everyone who does not have one. They pass away. Um, these laws say who is, has the, the priority right, to administer your estate, who has the priority to receive your estate as beneficiaries. Um, and, and I'll cut to the chase. It's limited to family only, family only. And you know, preparing a will in many ways is saying no to that default plan and saying, I want to do something on my own. I want to choose my executor. I want to choose my beneficiaries who, who receive my estate. And maybe it's family, maybe it's a combination of friends, family, charitable interests, which we'll talk about today. Um, perhaps there are beneficiaries in your life that need protection. Maybe there are young people who aren't in a position yet to receive a large sum of money or individuals who uh, struggle with um, uh, substance abuse or have difficulty holding money and uh, what's known as trust planning can be put into effect to protect those beneficiaries and, and protect the wealth for their well-being. Um, for, for those who have uh, young children or maybe young grandchildren, a will is, is commonly looked to to prepare, uh, to make guardianship plans, choose people to take care of your young children. Power to choose is what writing a will is all about. Now, for those of us who have wills out there, a common question that's asked of me is when is it time to change my will? When should I dust off that old document and, and, uh, and, and maybe call my lawyer or, or maybe sit down with my partner? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say that there's a hard and fast rule every two years, every five years, every 10 years. Those are, those are common numbers, but I encourage everyone to, to look at milestones that may have happened in your life. And, and listed on the slide, which I will absolutely not go through one by one, are, are examples of milestones in, in our lives where dusting off that old will, maybe speaking with your uh, professional advisor would be a good idea. Uh, the, maybe I'll, I'll highlight a couple that, uh, that I see most often that bring people in to see me. And um, it's, uh, it's actually right in the middle, this, this disability of a, of a beneficiary or, or death of an executor or beneficiary. Changes in your family life. Uh, the, to be specific, the common one I see is, is an executor has, is no longer in a position to administer my estate. Maybe someone will come in, they'll bring in a will from 1996. They'll say, this is largely still what we want to do, but my executor, my sister, um, is, is not well. Or my executor who's named, my, my brother, um, has passed away, unfortunately, and, and this will does not have an executor. That's, that's a very common thing I see. So do take a look at those wills. Um, and before I, I, I change the slides, the very last piece, tax optimization. You know, sometimes a will truly is it's still acceptable to, to a person, whether it's written last year or, or written in 1994. But um, the, the individual comes to see me or maybe their accountant or financial advisor and says, hey, I've read a little bit about taxes. Can I make my taxes as small as possible on death? And, and that's a, a common driver as well to, 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 to kickstart or reignite that, that will conversation. So. More on that, more on that a little later. Beneficiaries, so quick definition, a beneficiary is a, is a person um, uh, or, or organization or a corporation that receives from your estate, right? These are the, uh, these are the, the family, the friends, charitable interests that, are, um, that benefit from your estate through your will. Now, Commonly, there are three categories of beneficiaries that we come across. First, of course, family and friends. It's very common for individuals to say that they want their children to benefit, their grandchildren, their siblings, their cousins, uh, their best friends, right? Friends who are family, I like to say. Um, next, very common to consider charitable institutions, the creation of legacy, and, and, and Sherry Dahl is going to talk more about that later today. The third one, unfortunately, is the inadvertent beneficiary that is present in all of our estates, and that is the Canada Revenue Agency. Now, I'll provide a little more information about taxation, but there is, um, there is a, there are tax obligations at, uh, when, when people pass away, and the estate is subject to paying these taxes before these first two groups of beneficiaries receive their gifts. So in all our wills, whether we like it or not, the Canada Revenue Agency plays a part in benefiting from our estate. And we'll talk a little bit later about how to balance among these three types of beneficiaries and, and give as much as you want to give. 
On the note of giving, there are two general categories of gifts in a will. Specific bequests and share of residue. Now, to, to those out there who, who might have a background in this, there's, there's certainly different titles and different names for these uh, types of gifts. But generally speaking, we're looking at a specific bequest being a gift that is um, described uh, with certainty in the will. For example, $100,000 to the University of Calgary. This is a gift that is measurable. It has limits, right? $100,000 to the University of Calgary. This can also come in the form of, um, of, 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 of uh, real estate. Right, like uh, a certain property located at this address to the University of Calgary, right? Or stepping away from charitable giving, it could be as uh, something like ten thousand dollars to each of my grandchildren, right? So again, uh, a defined gift given to a, a specific person or institution. So what's this other type of gift? Share of residue. So this is how it might read in a will: ten percent of the residue of my estate, the University of Calgary. So this is a good opportunity to take a step back, talk a little bit about quick estate administration 101. What is residue uh, in, in, in the context of a, of a will and estate? A residue, for lack of a better term, is what's left in your estate after funeral expenses, uh, estate expenses have been paid, tax obligations have been fulfilled, specific bequests have been paid out. More on that, because we'll talk a little bit about priorities. Um, after these, these sort of higher priority obligations are paid out by the executor, the residue of the estate must be distributed. And you'll see, for those of you who have wills, time to dust off that document, and you'll see. It might say something along the lines of, I give the residue of my estate to my husband. I, give the, I divide and distribute the residue of my estate equally among my three children, right? Or maybe perhaps a percentage of the residue of your estate split in a particular way. So uh, reviewing uh, two general types of gifts, the specific bequest that's very clear and specific uh, and, and, and described with limits. And then there's the share of residue. The share of residue can be very large, right? At the end of the state administration, um, the residue in most cases is the bulk of your net estate and divided say three ways. So for example, um, maybe uh, parents of adult children will say, Divide our estate equally among our three adult children. Very simple. And the expectation, the plan, is that they would receive the bulk of the estate. But perhaps that will also has some specific requests. For example, $100,000 to the University of Calgary. I mentioned earlier this idea of priority. A specific bequest is paid before the residue is distributed. I like to say that it, uh, a bequest is paid off the top, right, before the estate is split three ways. So following the example of the the three adult children who split the residue of the estate, we're looking at a situation where uh, the $100,000 gift is given first, and then what the balance is paid after. So um, common questions that come up here are, well, if I'm gonna give a, a gift to, to friends or to charity, like for example, this $100,000 specific gift to the university, what if I don't have enough money at the end of my you know, at the end of my life. What if, example, what if my estate is worth $150,000 and I pass away with that will that I described? Well, yes, I suppose the, the, the $100,000 gift would be paid first and then the $50,000 would be divided equally among the three children. Perhaps that's not what mom or dad wants to achieve. Perhaps that's not what they want to achieve. So using the share of residue would be an effective way to always make sure that the charitable interest is fulfilled but the adult children divide the rest. So for example, the share of residue can read 10% of the residue of my estate to the University of Calgary and the remaining 90% split equally among my three children, 30% to each child, 10% to the university. And then there's certainty that um, all of these classes of beneficiaries will receive and, um, uh, and uh, we don't have a situation, right? Where the, the children aren't, aren't receiving enough, okay? Um, you can get fancy. I have clients, for example, from time to time that'll say, I like the idea of a 10% uh, share of my estate to, uh, to, to a charitable interest. But what if uh, at the time of my passing, my wealth has increased significantly? What if 10% what if is too much for me? Um, what if I, I pass away with a, with a winning lottery ticket in my back pocket? Now, 
a 10% share is, is given to uh, an organization or an individual and they're just receiving too much. So what you're seeing here on the slide is a way to blend the two types of gifts in a will. 10% of the residue of my estate to the, max, to the University of Calgary to a maximum of $100,000. So um, it, it's not discreet. It's not either or. There are ways to blend this type of giving to make sure that your will adapts to your life and gives that will some more shelf life so, so you don't need to, to maybe revisit it as often. Now it's time to get that second cup of coffee. We're gonna talk tax. Okay, I, I promise you this, this will be brief. This will be brief. Um, and I'll put my lawyer hat and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a tax specialist. Uh, there are excellent lawyers and advisors in town, accountants as well, of course, who, who can really walk you through uh, uh, some of the tax saving possibilities when planning your estate. But there's a few things that I do wanna share with you out there. So here we go, tax 101. There is something called a deemed disposition on death that can lead to quite a lot of capital gains and lead to a lot of taxes. What is this fancy word deemed disposition means? Essentially when a person passes away, they're, they're, they're treated as if they sold all of their capital property the moment they passed away. So imagine if a person passes away and they're, they're, they're deemed to have sold their capital property, they're deemed to have sold their real estate, deemed to have uh, liquidated a, a portfolio of, um, uh, of, of, of security, stocks, uh, deemed to cash in their entire RRSP for full value. Imagine being T4 for your entire RSP, right? So imagine this is all adding up to quite a big tax bill. And, and there are incentives provided to us from the federal government that allows charitable giving to minimize those taxes. And there are many, many ways. The two that I'll identify quite quickly here are um, gifts of public security. So I, I mentioned this idea where a person is deemed to have liquidated their entire portfolio of stocks on debt. And um, if you've got some winners in there, then, then, then you might be stuck with a lot of capital gains. Well, if those public securities are given to charity through your will, then there's a double bonus here. Not only uh, are the capital gains wiped clean, those capital gains are not realized, so to speak, from a, from a taxation standpoint, but the value of that gift turns into a tax receipt that can be used as a credit against other taxes in your estate or a previous year of life. Um, bottom line is uh, give, giving public securities is a, is, a, is a terrific way, terrific way to minimize taxes. Um, and again, RSP, another uh, type of asset that we have uh, the opportunity to give to charity. Again, there's uh, an opportunity there to, to wipe clean that, um, or wipe away, frankly, uh, uh, the, the, the related taxation. Um, one takeaway I, I want uh, the participants to, to, to take from these slides is, uh, is that it does not need to be absolutely explicit in your will to say 10%, for example, to the University of Calgary or 10% uh, to, to my favorite charitable institution that must be paid or shall be paid from this stock account, right? From, from uh, my, my, my RBC Dominion Securities account right? Paid with my Apple stocks, for example. Not necessary. But what you, you do want to see in, in your will, and again, another reason to dust that will off, is to see that your executor has the ability to pay a gift in kind, right? So the will might say uh, $100,000 to, to the university, but there'll be a clause, hopefully in your will, that says my executor can fulfill that $100,000 gift using securities, using other assets in my estate. And then there we have it. We have the opportunity for, uh, for tax minimization and, um, uh, and a gift given uh, in kind. And with a couple of minutes to go, I wanna talk a little bit about beneficiary designations. We've been talking about wills a lot this morning and uh, many of the participants might be aware that you can control quite a significant portion of your wealth through beneficiary designations. What I'm talking about commonly are RSPs, TFSAs, um, and life insurance. I would say those are the main, those are the most common assets where you have the authority, the, the, the freedom to name a beneficiary. I can say on my life insurance policy, while my will sits on a shelf, I can go to my life insurance agent and say, I wanna make a beneficiary change, right? I wanna remove my, my mom because I've been married for so many years now and I finally wanna put my wife on that beneficiary policy. By the way, Melissa, that has been done already. 
Anyhow, the um, <laughs> we all have the authority to change our beneficiaries on most policies. There are types of you know irrevocable beneficiaries, but we won't go there this morning. Um, but it's possible to choose who our beneficiary is on our RSP, on our TFSA, on our life insurance policy. And, and with, a, with a stroke of a pen and a signature and a date, we have redirected a large portion of our wealth to, to another direction. Um, doing this can make uh, charitable giving very easy and convenient, right? We can make the decision to give our RSP or TFSA or life insurance to a charitable institution of our choice without having to open up that dusty will, without having to call that crotchety, expensive lawyer who, who, uh, who's gonna make me wait for a month before they call me back or something like that. Um, sorry to the lawyers out there, uh, terrible joke. But um, there's a convenience. There's a convenience in using your beneficiary designation uh, to, to give to, to certain people and certain institutions in our lives. Um, and I think it's a terrific thing to do. I do. Um, my take, my, the takeaway that I do hope that, uh, that, you, that you receive here is um, inadvertently, sometimes we can kind of upset the big picture plan, right? Uh, a, a decision to download a beneficiary designation form from your wealth simple account, change the, 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 the fate of your TFSA without thinking about the grand plan. Where's everything else? going? What am I trying to achieve? What on earth am I doing here with, with these gifts and, and benefits going to family members? Um, forgetting to look at the big picture you know, can, can, can be, uh, in, in my view, a bit of a tragedy because we've, we've missed the mark on what we want to achieve. We talk a lot about legacy in the context of, of giving, and, and that is huge. That is huge. But there, there is a, there's a, a big picture here, a legacy for your family, a legacy on, on um, um, how you want to help others, uh, whether it is uh, charity or family or friends or extended family members, um, do consider the big picture. And if, uh, if, if you are looking to use a beneficiary designation to, to give to charity or specific individuals, make sure that it sings in harmony with your general plan. Now, I'm wrapping up a little bit early, but I, I, I hope that's okay with Blair. I, uh, I know that we're going to have a, a few questions a little bit later, and uh, I look forward to hearing from everybody. Thanks very much for your time today. Thanks, John. Great information for sure. And we do appreciate your expertise. Now I'd like to introduce Sherry Dahl, Director of Legacy Giving at the University of Calgary. Sherry's been with the university for about 10 years and has led the legacy giving team of two of us since 2016. She's a certified professional fundraiser and she is our expert on the many vehicles that people can use to give to the university. Sherry, the screen is yours. Thanks Blair. And I appreciate that very much. And John, you've done great so far, just touching on a few of the things um, that we want to talk about here today. So thanks for everyone for joining us. Uh, the University of Calgary's Legacy Society was launched in our 50th year, which was back in September of 2016. I can't believe it's that far uh, back already, um, but it was to help celebrate and encourage our donors. And our role, mine and Blair's, includes many things from increasing the number of donors who provide an estate gift to the University of Calgary, to stewarding existing bequest commitments and increasing membership in the University of Calgary Legacy Society. Uh, we work alongside executors and advisors when informed someone has passed away um, and having to deal with that, uh, the gift that's left to the University of Calgary. We're also a resource and a fundraiser for special gifts like shares, land, mineral rights, trusts, and significant gifts in kind. Next slide, please. Donors have dreams and the passion to change the world. It might be through supporting charities to provide clean water around the world, to fight disease, uh, to saving mothers and children and in developing nations, supporting education here and abroad, supporting older generations and growing local economies. Next slide, please. None of us have a crystal ball. 
But through legacy giving, we can truly change our path at the University of Calgary and around the world. When you let your favorite charity know about your plans, we can work together to make sure your dreams are achievable and can come true. Legacy giving or planned giving is a very effective way to reduce taxes, both in your lifetime and in your state, as John mentioned. It's your last best chance to direct funds to something that you believed was important to your family or even in your community when you were alive. It's your way to create a living legacy now and possibly have plans to increase it in the future. You can reduce your estate costs through effective planning. As John said, you know, you want to make sure that you know everything you can and plan accordingly. Next slide, please. If there is no will, there is no charitable bequest. So make sure you have a say in who gets to receive your hard earned estate assets. It's an important thing. And we always want to work closely with your professional advisor. We're not the experts. Uh, we wanna encourage you, please talk to your family and friends. As John said, you wanna look at the full picture and make sure that you're including everyone that you want to and having that future together and what you would like to leave. It's important that your favorite charity knows about your future intention and they can make sure that your wishes can actually be fulfilled. Next slide, please. Every year, thousands of donors collectively give tens of millions of dollars to the University of, Gal of Calgary, and that's collectively, so every little bit counts. We believe that you guys are giving us more than money, all the donors. We believe that it's giving us confidence in our future together, that there's a sharing of joy about learning and research and making an impact in the life of a student. That's what we're all about, education and students and creating a future. And because of our supporters, together we can change the world. Next slide, please. And so wrapping up with this, um, I just wanted to let you know that this is our contact information, but I'm gonna hand this back over to Blair and then we get into the meat of the presentation, which is those questions and answers. So we look forward to hearing what you might have as far as curiosity, and uh, hopefully we can answer those for you, or if not, follow up. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Great information for sure. So we've got a few questions that have come through our chat screen, and I believe the first one, John, is to you. Uh, so we're going to get you to uh, answer this. It comes from Anne. And it says, hello, I'd like to know if my spouse and I make a joint will or do we do one separately? Great question. John? Thanks for your question, Anne. Um, so by nature, a will uh, is, is done by one person at a time. It's done by one person at a time. So your will uh, disposes of your property. Uh, your spouse's will disposes of their property, right? They are, they are separate. Uh, and that's you know, by, by nature. Um, we, we commonly hear this idea of joint wills in the, in, the, in the sense that spouses have prepared their wills at the same time. So oftentimes they're sitting across from an advisor, lawyer in particular, and they're, they're instructing that lawyer together. So they're jointly engaged in the process. Um, and uh, common, but by no means a rule, and I'll tell you why in a moment, and common that their wills are what we call mirror images of each other. Um, so I don't know your personal circumstances, man. Happy to chat if you ever want to reach out. But uh, for, for example, let, let's imagine uh, a married couple is, is married, of course, and they have, and they have children together. Uh, their wills might read something like this. I give everything. I give the residue of my estate to my spouse. And if my spouse predeceases me, dies before me, then I divide everything equally among my three children. And that spouse's will will say the mirror image, the exact same thing. Their will says, I give everything to my spouse. But if they're not alive, divide everything among my three children, who are the very same three children in the other will. And mirror images, right? And, and sometimes nicknamed joint in that regard. Um, not always the case, right? Wills are as varied as, as, as families are, right? Uh, what if a person has uh, um, children from a previous marriage and, it's, and it doesn't fit their wish to give everything to their second spouse. They have children from the first marriage that they want to benefit. Um, 
So not uncommon to have wills that look a little bit different, right? Furthermore, going to this idea of sitting across the table with, with one advisor, sometimes, um, sometimes one partner isn't ready to prepare their will. Maybe only one person is, is, is engaged and, and ready to make these decisions and work with their lawyer and the other's not quite there yet for one reason or another, right? Um, so again, the empowerment is yours. The, the empowerment is individual in nature. You can instruct your lawyer to prepare a will how you want it and that will sit separately. Now, a quick public service announcement. It's, you know, with, with partners in particular, spouses, um, individuals that are in common law relationships, uh, it would be prudent to prepare your wills at the same time. Maybe not necessarily with the same advisor. It's not uncommon for, for couples to have separate lawyers, especially if it's a second marriage. Um, but the takeaway here, and this is going to this idea about the grand plan, uh, is to prepare your documents at the same time, at least concurrently, so that we know what each other are doing, right? Who is, who is receiving what? And, and if the other's not alive, then what, right? Your plan, again, is your individual plan, but there certainly is uh, a lot to be said about, about uh, doing this together. Thanks, John. We have another question, uh, again, for you, John. Um, Helena uh, asks, what is your recommendation on writing your first will? Okay. So we talked a little bit about, you know, revisiting your will. Helena would like to know what your recommendations are would be on your first will. Sure. Thanks, Helena, for your question. A first will. Well, um, you know, as self-serving as it sounds, I, I, I do encourage you to work with a professional, in particular, uh, a work with a, with a lawyer who has um, experience in preparing wills. They can walk you through the process and make sure that your will is executed properly so there are no issues regarding uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, the signing protocol. There's no issues with its, uh, um, with its form and making sure that it's, it's admissible down the road. Um, but maybe some big picture things. I mean, I don't want to get tied up about number of witnesses and Make sure your assets are here and there. There's a lot of questions that come later, but maybe some state of mind, some certain um, uh, certain places where, where I encourage your our, our minds and hearts to be, Helena, are to think a little bit about, I always like to say, the two core purposes of a will. At the end of the day, despite how long and complicated a will can be, Helena, a will does two things. It says, who gets your stuff and who does the work? Right? And I would start by putting your mind there. Think to yourself, right? who is going to receive my things? Who's going to receive um, my home? Who's going to receive my bank accounts? Who's going to receive all this stuff? Right? And who would I empower to make that happen? Who can I trust in my life? Who can um, take control of these affairs? Who has time in their lives to, be, to take this role of executor? Right? Um, you know, it's, on average, it's a year and a half, even a two-year job to ask someone, to make this all happen. So do consider carefully about who the right person would be. If you're thinking about, um, for example, for those for yourself, or maybe some of our participants, if you're thinking about uh, adult children as a possible beneficiary, sorry, uh, as a possible executor of your estate, be mindful, they might also be a beneficiary of your estate, right? They, 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 they stand to receive on one hand, and they also stand to do quite a lot of work. Uh, I'll mix it up a little bit. That executor, that, that adult child, um, is in a position to be a, to, to account to the other beneficiary, right? They're, they've got the peanut gallery of siblings who have things to say about how that estate administration is going. So bringing this back to you, Helena, uh, do you consider about who might be the right diplomat in your life? Who has that level of diplomacy to deal with and address the, all of the, the interests of the beneficiaries? Um, there are so many more things I can go to, but I always like to go back to those two core principles. The will is saying, who gets your things? And who does the work? And that's always a, a good starting point. Fantastic, John. That's, that's really great advice. Okay, we're uh, continuing. We've got some more questions. Um, is it a problem that my executor is in BC, but I live in Alberta? Do you want to address that, John? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I'd say there are, um, there are two complications. There are two complications with a with an executor that lives in, in British Columbia. Um, the first one, and this is one that's uh, very Googleable. So uh, if anyone wants to do their own research, they'll, 
they'll they'll read about this uh, the circumstance where the the executor would need to post a bond in order to uh, administer the estate, specifically in order for them to, to get something called a grant of probate. Maybe we'll have a moment to talk about what that means. But generally speaking, there's this idea that there's a, a bond. They need to post an insurance bond. So it comes at an expense. It comes at your expense. The estate needs to pay for basically insurance coverage um, because uh, you know for, for liability of the executor. And this is because the executor lives out of province. Um, now, in, in my practice, the insurance bond is actually very rarely placed because the, uh, the executor can, can canvass the beneficiaries and say, hey, do you trust me? Is it going to be okay? Do I need to post this bond? And the beneficiaries can sign off. They can consent to no bond and the court can remove that requirement. So it's, it's, it, it is a, you know, a, a set of motions and steps that need to be taken early on in the estate administration regarding the removal of this bond, but it can be done. And the bond in, in, in most estate administrations are not a concern. So I wanna say that one first. It's, it's, the, it's the first issue is, is in my view, a minor one. In my experience, a minor issue, but something to consider. It's a, it's a set of motions that has to be done, um, which otherwise would not have to be done if the executor was, was here in province. Um, the second issue with, a, with an out of province executor, uh, and this is the bigger one in my view, is, is convenience and logistics, right? Does it make sense uh, to the grand plan, so to speak, to have an executor out of province. Here's an example. So I, I, I would guess a bunch of our, a lot of our, of our participants today are, are, are here in, in Calgary. So example, put yourself in a situation where you're now told that you need to sell a house in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Can you do it? Of course you can do it, right? Uh, you put on a mask, you, sl you jump on a plane, um, you get to the house there, maybe uh, whoever owned the house, maybe it was a friend or, or, or a family member that passed away, they left you the key, right? There's a will, um, there's, a, there's a, a ton of good lawyers and realtors in town, you can do it, absolutely. But how convenient is that for you, right? What does your personal life look like? Do you have the bandwidth in your life to manage the sale of a property? Now, you don't have to move to, to, to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario for several months while the sale is happening. You might go there for a couple of weeks to establish affairs, make some contacts, come back to Calgary, then yes, you're instructing that realtor from, uh, you know, through Zoom or uh, dealing with a 1-800-junk company to clean out the basement. It's possible, right, folks? It's possible to do these things. But how convenient is it uh, for that, for, for you? How convenient is it for that executor out of BC? Are we setting them up for success? Does this make sense, right? And, and, and that's the biggest issue uh, that I see with an out of province or even an out of town executor, right? You know, choosing someone who lives uh, in, in Cold Lake. Um, sure, they're here in the province, so there's no uh, bond issues, but uh, that, that's a heck of a drive. And, and uh, is that something that's going to work for everybody? Excellent. Okay, um, well, you did mention uh, that word probate, John, and uh, we have a question. Uh, acknowledging that each province may have different rules for probate, what is probate and how does it work here in Alberta? Okay. Yeah, what walked into that question? So Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Came prepared, came prepared. So um, first thing I want everyone to know, the pro probate is, 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 is not the boogeyman that it, it, that it, it you know, <laughs> seems to be uh, regarded as, and, and hopefully I can help everyone out with that. So, uh, I'm a bit of a, you can probably pick up here now. I, I had to like tie my hands down during the bulk of this presentation, but now it, I'm, I've been unleashed. I'm very handsy, so I, I, I like visuals. So here we go. We have a will here, right? I'm going to cover some names. But this, this is a valid will here, right? This has been signed, dated. It's, it's a witness. This is the real thing. This is the real, real thing. And um, make no mistake, this will gives legal authority to an executor, to the named executor, to administer the estate of this person that signed that will. So what is probate then, right? Uh, here's an example, um, or I, I, I always like to, 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 to explain this with, a, with an example. Um, if, if the executor here in this will was to take this to the bank after this person has died, this will, this will has, gives that executor quite a lot of power, right? Uh, that executor, um, along with a death certificate, can ask the bank, uh, how much did my, for example, in this case, well, how much did my uncle own at this bank? What, what, what did he have here? What were the accounts? The bank will give that information, right? Powerful, powerful. That, that can't go to everybody, right? The privacy laws to prevent, prevent a lot of people from seeing that stuff, but the executor can see it. Okay, the next question the executor will ask, 
um, may I have that money, please? I have work to do here, right? Now, here's the twist. That banker might say, well, um, I'm, you know, I'm sorry about the passing of your uncle, but um, he, he had $750,000 worth of assets on deposit here. And that is just too much money for us to release to you. I recognize you have a valid will. I recognize you have a death certificate from the funeral home, but it is our policy that we need to see not just a will, we need to see a probated will, a grant of probate. Um, this term, by the way, has different names across the country and across the United States. So it, it's kind of confusing, but the common term is probate. What is the bank saying? The bank is saying to this, to this executor, who's now very frustrated, that this will just ain't enough. $750,000 is too much for this bank to give, to just hand over to this executor on this will. It could be a fake will. There could be some circumstances in the family that. That, that could make handing over this money complicated. So what this executor is going to do now is going to file this will in court with about a half inch thick worth of application documents to the court. And basically you're asking the court, validate this will, confirm that this is the real thing. And, 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 and depending on where you are in the province, um, you'll receive back a photocopy of this will with a court stamp right on the front saying, this is now a probated will. That executor can now go back to that bank manager and say, ha ha, I've got a probated will. And now that $750,000 will be released to that executor because that executor has work to do for the next year and a half. Um, that's a common, you know, a, a common scenario where probate is granted. But let's change the facts. What if that, uh, what if that uncle had $20,000, a relatively modest amount of uh, assets on deposit at that bank? And that was the extent of what he owned. Maybe he, he rented, maybe he lived uh, in, in long-term care and $20,000 is what he had on deposit at that bank. Well, on those facts, the bank manager might say, you know what, you know, consulting with head office, we're gonna get it to you. We're gonna make you sign a bunch of forms executor, but with that will, and based on that value of money, if you're at on deposit, we're gonna give that, hand that money over to you because you have an estate to administer. So note that banks have discretion to uh, what, I, what we call, you know, waive the requirement for probate. And the numbers I gave you are very accurate, not uncommon for a bank and maybe in the neighborhood of 20,000, even higher to, 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 to respect a will that's not been probated. But 700,000 certainly is, is, is a value that a bank would ask for probate. Uh, another circumstance, and maybe I should have said this first, another circumstance where probate is absolutely necessary is if the deceased owned real estate here in Alberta in their own name. So if that uncle, for example, owned a condominium in his own name, then in order for that executor in this will to, uh, uh, to, to, to ultimately sell that condo, they need to get that grant of probate. So. Um, you know, uh, one exercise I like to do with clients is, is to sort of run through your asset mix, run through what you own and ask ourselves, is probate necessary? And, 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 and then just, and also just be sort of be at peace with respect to what probate is, because it's, it's not as bad as it seems. Great information, John. That's fantastic. I hope that helps uh, some folks with uh, the terminology. I know uh, Sherry and I both get asked that question often. And unfortunately, we cannot describe it nearly as well as we can. So uh, thank you for that. All right, we're closing in on our 9.15 time. Um, as we wrap up, first of all, I'd like to thank both speakers, Jerry, as well as John. Thank you for your time, both of you. Uh, and thank you to the participants on this call, the Zoom call. We uh, appreciate the, the participation. This is a series of what we hope will be uh, a number of these kinds of short sessions on legacy giving. So watch for the future sessions along uh, with today, you will receive a recording of this session and a survey, uh, which we appreciate any feedback that you're willing to give us. You'll see on the screen are all our contact information. We're happy to discuss things with you. Um, and uh, we do appreciate uh, all the calls or interest uh, from the University of Calgary's perspective. So again, stay well, stay healthy, look after each other out there, and thanks again. Bye-bye now.